we're using has divided it into 15 chapters. And so we're going to do an introduction tonight, and then we'll do a chapter a week beginning, Lord willing, next week. So I'm very excited about this. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress is a wonderful, wonderful book, uh, one of the most uh, incredible books I've ever read in my life, and I've read it many, many times. If you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, you're in for a treat. Uh, it's a fabulous book. I read it the first time when I was a senior in high school, and the teacher made fun of the book and thought it was awful, and uh, made, made it very clear that she thought it was uh, you know, not anything significant, and she was baffled by how it could be such a classic. Um, and that affected me a great deal. I, I didn't read it very much, of course, after that. And then many years later, picked it up uh, by a recommendation of a friend and read it and thought that it was virtually uh, inspired, uh, which I do believe it's, it's about as close to being inspired as you can get outside the Bible. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. The first observation I'm going to make with you is this. Where does it take place? Where, where is the author? Jail. He's in jail, and where is he in jail? Well, he's in Bedford. John Bunyan is in Bedford, England. Bedford, England, to translate that would be like Burgal. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the point is this. Look what came out of Bedford, England. Look what came out of Bedford, England. Mark Twain once said that to commit suicide in Buffalo, New York would be redundant. Uh, there are some places you just don't expect much from. And Bedford, you wouldn't expect that the God of the universe would place a book in the hands, in the heart, in the mind of a prisoner in the jail of Bedford. What does that translate to you? What could God do in Wilmington? What could God do in our lives? Well, all we need is to be pleading with God that God would uh, do such an awakening here. There is a great need once again. And one of the ways that we can be encouraged toward awakening is to read about people who were greatly used of God in the past. Uh, and John Bunyan was marvelously used of God uh, in a remarkable way. But long before he was used of God, he was tested and shaped by God. And we want to look at some of that background tonight that gave birth to this incredible book. Well, let's start in prayer. Father God, we do praise you and thank you for your goodness and mercy to us day after day in the gospel of Jesus Christ and in your steadfast love. We thank you now for this opportunity to gather around this book as we consider the pilgrim's path. Father, it's our desire that we would be affected by this. We want to study and learn of you and of how you have used men in the past to the glory of your name, and how you've done it in wonderful ways in your timing. We come before you acknowledging that we ourselves are in great need of strengthening and encouragement, and that your church is in desperate need of awakening. We plead with you that you would yet save many, that you would revive and strengthen and cause your kingdom to once again flourish here in southeastern North Carolina and around the world. We acknowledge that what we're asking for is a work of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you will do that to the glory of your name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christian, in the book, and we'll come to the book a little bit, I'll give you a bit of a bio later, or an overview of the book. Uh, Christian uh, likes to lapse into poetry. Uh, he likes to sing as he walks along and so there is a hymn that comes out of it, and there are several other individual um, poems that are written that Christian speaks of while he's walking. But the idea of a journey used to be, the idea of this life being a journey used to be an enormously popular theme, the idea that we are pilgrims. <coughs> uh, we don't get that very much today, uh, less and less and less in modern evangelical church, um, a hymn that you're probably familiar with and have sung uh, is uh, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. <clears throat> and listen to what this says um, in regard to the Christian life. Guide me, O Thou Great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain where the healing stream doth flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar, a reference to Moses, lead me all my journey through. 
Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, death, bid my anxious fears subside. Death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to you, I will ever give to you. The idea of always being aware of where you're going and thinking of yourself as a pilgrim is a very uh, <coughs> prominent theme in the Bible. But it is a rare thing today. We have become quite, uh, quite comfortable uh, with the world. Just a couple of other hymns uh, very quickly on that subject. Uh, boy, uh, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, if you're not familiar with that hymn. Uh, I am resolved no longer to linger. I am bound to the promised land. Who is on the Lord's side? Who are these like stars appearing? John Newton, wonderful hymn. Uh, Give me the wings of faith to rise. <coughs> Isaac Watts um, wrote that glorious hymn, and George Whitfield talked about uh, preaching and singing that, and the people just weeping as they sang that wonderful hymn. Um, and then he who would valiant be, uh, the hymn that uh, John Bunyan wrote. Um, another hymn that uh, someone wrote, and I don't know who wrote this, and it's not really ascribed to anybody, it's kind of a folk song almost, um, it's been around so long, keep on the firing line. Christian leads, leaves the city of destruction, and he heads, yes, and he heads toward the celestial city, and he comes through many, <clears throat> many dangers and toils and snares. Listen to this. If you're in the battle for the Lord and right, keep on the firing line. If you win, my brother, surely you must fight. Keep on the firing line. There are many dangers that we all must face if we die still fighting. It is no disgrace. Cowards in the service will not find a place. So keep on the firing line. Or you must fight. Be brave <coughs> against all evil. Never run, nor even lag behind. If you would win for God in the right, just keep on the firing line. God will only use a soldier he can trust. Keep on the firing line. If you will wear a crown, then bear the cross you must. Keep on the firing line. Life is but to labor for the master, dear. Help to banish evil and to spread good cheer. G great, you'll be rewarded for your service here. So keep on the firing line. The idea of perseverance is a dominant theme in the scriptures. And today we have moved into an antinomian era that seems to know very little about perseverance and the call of Christ. Jesus says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. If Hebrews were being written today, John Bunyan would be included in that book, in this uh, list of the greats in chapter 11. Well, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 38. If you don't know this, memorize this. <coughs> Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And John Bunyan understood that. He understood that, and it affected his heart, and it affected his mind. Does anybody know what a pantocrator is? A pantocrator is over the front of virtually every church in England. When you go into every church in England, there's a grave stone carved into the side, of, right over the front door. It's a picture of Christ of the judgment. It's not a picture of Christ with a lamb or with a bunny rabbit. It's a picture of Christ of judgment. That every time they enter the church and every time they leave the church, they are looking and being mindful that they are only pilgrims in this world. And heaven and the judgment of God is where they're headed. At all times, they're very mindful of that orientation. It's very, very helpful for us to be thinking about that in terms of where we are. In the book of Revelation, Christ appears... Uh, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Christ appears and clarifies once again sort of who he is because he's aware that there's 
some confusion. He is fully God and fully man. And because of the incarnation, some saw him primarily, if not exclusively, as man and failed to grasp that he was God. But in Revelation 2 and 3, he writes the seven letters. And in the seven letters, he says in chapter 2, as he writes to the church at Ephesus, chapter 2, verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden of the paradise of God. And then the very next one, uh, he says, um, verse 11, He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And in the next one, verse 17, He who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And in the next one, verse 26, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And in the next one, in chapter 3, verse 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And the next one, chapter 3, verse 12, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And finally, in verse 21, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Brothers and sisters, overcoming is a dominant theme in the scriptures, and John Bunyan understood that. And as he writes this book, he writes it in a way that shows that he understands it from the heart, and it just sort of comes out, and he says, well, what would that look like in someone's life? Uh, the whole concept of walking with God and the challenges that are there. Uh, many years ago, I had the opportunity to, um, uh, to go to Disney World for the first time uh, with a child, with my son. I had gone to Disney World many, many times in my life, but never with a, a child. Um, and a friend of ours recommended that if you're going to go to Disney World, you must read one of those insider books, you know, guides. And I thought, well, you know, I know all about Disney World. I've been there many times. I don't really need that. But we thought, well, after thinking about it more and more, well, you know, what harm could it do? Well, this book tells you all about exactly when to go to this ride, when to go to that ride. What, you know, just that it, 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 somebody had been there. They understood that if you want to have your child's picture taken with Dumbo, you better head right to Dumbo when the door opens. Because there's going to be a long line there for you. <clears throat> and they understood that if you don't take your child home at around 3.30 in the afternoon and force them to do something else and take a break, and then bring them back to the park, if you want to bring them back at night for the closing ceremonies and all that, you know, take them home, take them to a nap. And if you don't do that, they said, then look around on the faces of the people at 8.30 at 9 o'clock when those fireworks start going off and the children look like they've been beat with chains. <laughs> So we read the book, and we did everything the book said. And we were just like, wow. <laughs> it transformed our experience. Pilgrim's Progress is not a vacation guide. It's a survival guide. It's not a vacation guide. It's a survival guide. And when you meet people who haven't read it, or have read it, and it didn't affect them, it's because they had no clue. They had no clue of the great call of Jesus Christ, and of the great pull of the world, the devil, and of the flesh. But John Bunyan did understand that. He understood it, and he, he puts it down in this beautiful book, and we have the opportunity to pick it up and read it, uh, and it's a wonderful book to do that. But I do want to encourage you that it is not. It makes no sense. You'll find very quickly in this, it makes no sense to you if you pick up Pilgrim's Progress and you want to read it with an oriental carpet under your feet and a cup of international coffee and some Lord of the Dunes, you know, and a pipe. It makes no sense to you. It's not written for that kind of